Yeah, can you see my screen? Oh, sorry, I think it's... It's not visible, sir. Not visible, I'll share again. Yes, visible it has now? Come. Yeah, yeah, it has come. Yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, I bring you greetings from Bangalore. As you can see, a beautiful city, uh, rivaled only by the beauty of the city that our next speaker, Professor Basan Gaudapa, comes from, Mysore, which in most people's opinion is even better than this. I also bring you greetings from uh, Narayan Hridayalia, the Basmdar Shaw Medical Center where I work, and my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. This is my conflict of interest statement. I have spoken at conferences uh, and received sponsorship for these conferences from companies that manufacture medications used in COPD and other disorders. My interest in the comorbidities of COPD, recognizing that COPD is more than just a lung disease, started with a patient of mine. I looked after him for about 14 years until he finally passed away in about 2018. And this was his variety of problems. As you can see, I'm not going to take you through it, but this is a huge list of problems. So I was wondering, why does one man, a very rich man, he's a mine owner, uh, old, but, you know, variety of problems, and I couldn't quite figure out why he had so many. So I asked myself, is COPD a lung disease? Yes, obviously, that by definition, it's a pulmonary disease. But I also asked, is COPD only a lung disease? And the resounding answer was no. Then I looked at the publications on comorbidities of COPD, and you can see that before 1991, there was just a single publication. But over the last few decades, there's been a boom in the number of publications. And in the last year itself, in 2021, which we've not even come to the end of, there's been more than 14,000 publications. So you can imagine the interest in this condition and the increasing recognition that this is a huge problem. So what do I... Uh, plan to speak on. I'm going to ask myself, is COPD associated with significant comorbidities? If so, why? What is the impact of these comorbid conditions? And should this modify our clinical approach when we are looking after a patient with COPD? This is the definition of COPD according to Goal 2022. Yes, the documents already come out a little in advance of 2022. But I'll call your attention to the last sentence. Significant comorbidities may have an impact on morbidity and mortality. When we're talking about comorbidities and systemic consequences, what exactly do we mean? A systemic consequences are the non-pulmonary manifestations of COPD, and they have a demonstrated immediate cause and effect relationship. What I'm going to be speaking about is diseases that are associated with COPD. Some of them may have a cause-effect relationship, some of them may not, but they occur very commonly with this condition, hence they are comorbidities. So the question is, is COPD associated with comorbidities? Yes. And I must remind you that there may be major features in the clinical presentation of COPD. In fact, they may overshadow the COPD very often. How common are they? These are various different studies. This was a good uh, meta-analysis that appeared in the International Journal of COPD about six years ago and show you the variety of comorbidities both within the lung, which are not COPD, but also outside the lung. Extremely common conditions like diabetes, osteoporosis, and so on. And specifically, the heart and other cerebro and cardiovascular diseases that are very commonly associated with COPD. This was a good study, a real-world retrospective cohort study called the Arctic study from Sweden. They compared patients with COPD and non-COPD patients and found that compared to a reference population of non-COPD patients, cardiovascular diseases were extremely common. This was before the diagnosis of COPD was made. And then when they worked them up, they found that it was extremely common uh, in, to, in COPD patients to have a cardiovascular disease. Much commoner, two and a half times as common as in the reference population. And this is true across the board for many of these comorbidities, both pre-diagnosis and after diagnosis. And you can see that the increase was not so much when it was looked at for other diseases, 
They did find more diseases, obviously, when you look harder, but the amount of increase is not so high. So asthma problem went up threefold, fractures were found to be almost five times as common. And it's not just that they're commoner, but they place a much greater economic burden on the patient. And in the case of Sweden, where the government picks up the bill, on the, on the government, on the economy. Uh, so these are patients with the reference population, where the expenditure for the population was about 5,000 uh, euros per year. And you can see that 27,000 pounds plus was the expenditure in COPD, most of which was in the comorbidities cost. The COPD cost was high, yes, but the comorbidities cost was much, much higher. So it's not only an individual problem, it's a state problem, it's a system problem, not just a systemic problem. So when I looked at my patient, Mr. P's problems, the ones in orange or amber tend to be those that are classically described in COPD, and the others were probably purely coincidental. Number eight, I've described as in yellow, because we now realize that tuberculosis... ...which has recommended in the guidelines of ACC 2017. And third thousand, it is the risk of heart failure... Sorry, there's another talk seems to be going on. So here, uh, uh, indications are there. In the chef trial, yes, what is the important the message from the chef trial? There's a cross link of... Uh, the total stroke by 36%. The stroke is... Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're... Uh, I'm audible. Okay, so tuberculosis now is associated with the greater uh, chance of COPD and it's now called tuberculosis-associated obstructive pulmonary disease. We don't recognize many of these uh, comorbidities. For example, facial wrinkling, looking old, is common in COPD, much commoner than in the non-COPD population. Similarly, eye and endocrine disorders, much, much more common, as is rhinosinusitis. GERD is probably more common, but it's so common in the general population that you can see that there is a huge uh, variation, a wide ST in this population. Not only is it more common, but the presence of a comorbidity worsens the outcome. So patients with COPD who had comorbidities had many more hospital, uh, much more hospital mortality as compared to those without uh, COPD for the same comorbidity. So COPD worsens the outcome of the comorbidity and the comorbidity out worsens the outcome of the COPD also. So you look at a condition like obstructive sleep apnea. Again, much worse survival when a person has the overlap, uh, COPD with the overlap, whereas if they use the C, uh, CPAP machine, it improves, but it's still worse than patients with COPD alone. So COPD with OSA does much worse than COPD without OSA. So the presence of the OSA worsens the outcome of the COPD. So what's the learning point from this? The learning point is that comorbidities are common in COPD. So please look for and treat comorbid disease in patients with COPD. And I'll come back to this point a little later. So when you look at what happens in COPD because of the smoke, whether it's cigarette smoke or fossil fuel smoke, there is lung inflammation and this spills over into the system to cause systemic inflammation with all the various effects on multiple systems. Why does this happen? It's because the fumes, the smoke induces oxidative stress, circulating cytokines and acute phase response proteins, which induce inflammatory and other immune cells, as well as other inflammatory mediators, which cause damage. And more and more, we are realizing that this happens in the presence of certain genes and of great interest these days is the TERT mutations, which look at telomerase. And they've shown that patients with shorter telomeres have accelerated aging, not just of the lung, they of all systems. And the effect of the smoke is greater in patients who already have short telomeres, which means patients with TERT mutations, which renders them unable to repair their telomeres. There are other implicated candid candidate genes and both genetic and, and epigenetic factors need to be further investigated. And very interestingly for pulmonologists, they're trying to find a link between patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and COPD because both seem to have TERT mutations. 
both seem to have accelerated aging. And depending on whether the accelerated aging hits the epithelium or the mesenchyme, you end up with either IPF or COPD. This is a paper we wrote several years ago on the flow of events in COPD. And so we go from causes, which basically is tobacco smoke or environmental smoke, through various amplifying processes like genes and epigenetic processes, a variety of tissue events, which includes telomere shortening through various pathological processes, which we classically recognize as chronic bronchitis and emphysema, but also DNA damage in atherosclerosis and the metabolic syndrome to the systemic consequences of COPD, cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and import importantly, depression. But these systemic effects are not late. They occur early. And you can see them whether we're dealing with early stages of gold. Patients have one, two, or more comorbidities. And the hazard ratio goes up for mortality in patients with more comorbidities, not just those with more COPD. And the question to be asked is, what happens if we intervene early? Can we improve outcomes? And this very good study showed that just intervening with smoking cessation over a 14-year period, this trial was conducted, significantly reduced the mortality in patients who had special interventions as compared to those who received just usual care. And this was just smoking intervention, smoking cessation intervention. Imagine if we add on the other things that I'm going to tell you about. One of the other mechanisms for the comorbidities is something we refer to as the downward spiral of COPD, where it starts with airflow limitation, producing dyspnea, producing deconditioning, and person gets more and more isolated, depressed, doesn't go out, which worsens his muscle impairment. And all this leads to worsening dyspnea and hypoxia and mortality. So it starts with COPD, but goes on through inactivity, leading to worse conditions. So one of the things that is, is thought is that not just pharmacotherapy, but if you have pulmonary rehabilitation, we can reverse this downward spiral by not just reducing bronchodilatation, but also improving exercise capacity, increasing daily activities, reducing social isolation and depression, and therefore improving the overall quality of life as well as the overall survival. Among the other conditions that we speak about, commonly associated with comorbidities is obstructive sleep apnea, as well as COPD. And all these are characterized by endothelial dysfunction. We are talking about OSA, obesity, COPD, diabetes, hypertension, insulin resistance, and cardiovascular disease. So it looks like endothelial dysfunction is an important common factor which is why two former presidents of the European Respiratory Society, Rabri, uh, La Laurel Rabri and Klaus Rabe, said, why don't we call it chronic systemic inflammatory syndrome instead of COPD? Because it's more than just a pulmonary disease. This is a systemic inflammatory syndrome. I'll focus on a few specific comorbidities, the commonest being cardiovascular disease. And you can see that data from the Saskatchewan Health Database which has over a million patients, showed that cardiovascular disease was more common a cause of death than COPD itself, almost five patients more uh, in terms of patient years. And more patients were hospitalized for cardiovascular disease than for the COPD itself. What is the link between COPD and uh, cardiovascular disease? It is, as I mentioned earlier, systemic inflammation because of hypoxemia and arterial stiffness all of which increases thrombosis and thromboembolic phenomena through endothelial dysfunction. But also hyperinflation has various hemodynamic effects on the cardiovascular system. And we can reverse this hyperinflation as well as work on endothelial dysfunction and reduce inflammation. We can probably reduce both cardiovascular disease and COPD. And this has been clearly shown that both morbidity and mortality due to cardiovascular disease have been common not just myocardial infarction, coronary artery disease, but arrhythmias, failure, embolic disease, ischemic strokes, and hemorrhagic strokes. And in fact, one of the large trials of COPD, the TORCH trial, showed that about 27% of deaths were due to cardiac causes, while about a third were due to respiratory causes.
we looked at our own data we took patients with cardiovascular disease who often had not had a in fact none of them had had a pre diagnosis of copd and found that 23% of patients with cardiovascular disease had comorbid copd and this was both early and late copd so this is not just advanced copd with patients with cardiovascular disease had advanced copd to mild copd but copd was present in almost half of them neuropsychiatric disorders extremely common and getting old as patients grow older in patients with copd the neurovascular complications and the neuropsychological complications seem to increase depression is extremely common in copd 40% of patients with copd had at least mild depression as compared to just about 15% in the general population what is the consequence it leads to lower quality of life greater functional impairment and decreased adherence to treatment and in fact depression is commoner in copd than in lung cancer you'd expect patients with lung cancer to have more depression more anxiety it was shown early on that both these are much commoner in patients with copd and why does this happen it's because depressed patients smoke more because like it or not smoking is an antidepressant it works on the nicotinic receptors but the other problem is because of depression patients are unable to have the motivation to quit smoking and when they try to quit smoking their depression returns so they go back to smoking because that's often worse and one of the very useful anti smoking smoking cessation drugs bupropion was first actually developed as an antidepressant what was our experience we published this paper many years ago 150 patients with copd assessed for depression compared with patients with other similar chronic diseases a very high rate of depression in our copd patients 95% had at least mild depression as found by the hamilton depression rating scale and what is the cause of uh, consequence of this the lot of functional impairment work limitation 100% in patients with copd social limitation 20% in patients with copd much more in other chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension so finally what does all this that we've discussed mean in terms of patient management the diagnosis and assessment of the severity of copd may be greatly affected by the presence of the comorbid condition so our assessment should be comprehensive not just the lung not just spirometry we need to look at cardiac function both the left heart and the right heart we need to check their glycemic state we need to me- measure their bone density we need to look for depression objectively not just seeing are you depressed look for anemia rule out cancer because it's three and a half times more common in patients with copd than other smokers we need to use some common strategies for all the comorbidities smoking prevention and cessation maintenance of an ideal body weight diet and exercise rehabilitation possibly antioxidants these are common for example for cardiovascular disease just as much as it is for copd we use drugs for copd and other drugs for comorbidities we should be using all these in patients with copd why because cardiovascular drugs are found to have unexpected beneficial effects in copd for example statins may have good anti inflammatory properties and we may soon be using a poly pill for copd not just to prevent cardiovascular disease beta blockers this was an excellent uh, meta analysis that appeared in the european heart journal last year showing that beta blocker use significantly improved survival and pulmonary function in patients with a combination of copd and cardiovascular disease very significant reductions in mortality and this was an early study that showed that patients with beta blocker and uh, who were on beta blockers with copd had much better survival than those who were not put on beta blockers so please don't deny your patients with copd beta blockers again when you're looking at statins whichever cause uh, you look at whether it's cardiovascular mortality or all cause mortality or cancer related mortality or respiratory related mortality use of statins was favored in all these groups in practically all the studies there were only two studies which remained a bit equivocal and all cause mortality definitely came down in other meta analyses also people often point to the statcope trial this was only a trial that said that simvastatin did not reduce acute exacerbations of copd 
So please don't deny your patients with COPD the benefits of beta blockers and statins. But look at it the other way. COPD drugs may also help with cardiovascular disease. And we know that these bronchodilators and steroids actually have a beneficial effect in cardiovascular disease. And again, multiple metamal and meta-analyses showing that the combination of in, uh, inhaled corticosteroids and LABA significantly improved survival in patients with COPD in reference to a control group who received only uh, short-acting beta agonists and anti-muscarinics without the inhaled steroids. So all these, this was a former uh, consultant I worked with, Professor Brian Lipworth, excellent meta-analysis showing that a combination of inhaled drugs as well as beta blockers seems to significantly improve outcomes in COPD. Don't forget antidepressants, not Ripplin improves mood uh, when compared to placebo, uh, both at entry and uh, after 12 weeks. Anxiety improved, but also physical symptoms improved, and dyspnea came down when you put them on not Ripplin. More and more, we are recognizing the role of pulmonary rehabilitation at all stages, and this will help not only in the COPD, but in cardiovascular disease. So it helps with the extra pulmonary manifestations of COPD. So we should soon, soon be talking not only about pulmonary rehabilitation, but of cardiopulmonary rehabilitation in patients with COPD. We can't finish a talk without referring to COVID-19. And all our patients with COPD have done much better during COVID-19 than we expected. Fewer patients went on mechanical ventilation. No one went on ECMO because they were probably denied ECMO. But the all-cause mortality when patients with COPD developed COVID-19 was worse. Fortunately, the numbers were quite low. So what is needed finally is we need to involve internists and general physician in all stages of management of COPD. COPD should not be managed only by pulmonologists. It should be managed by physicians also and by a combination of specialties. So we need to change the approach, not only of clinicians, but also of the healthcare system. So I'll stop with a few key messages. COPD is preventable and treatable. It needs early diagnosis and intervention. It's characterized by comorbidities and by systemic inflammation. All bronchodilator combinations help reduce COPD and cardiovascular mortality. And beta blockers and statins reduce COPD mortality in the high-risk groups. Please consider pulmonary rehabilitation, or I should call it cardiopulmonary rehabilitation, in all symptomatic COPD patients. But the most important, in patients with cardiovascular disease, please search for and treat COPD. And in all patients with COPD, please search for and treat cardiovascular disease. Thank you for your patient listening and for this invitation to speak here. Uh, I ended with these gems because these are what my patient, Mr. P, started collecting to the end of, towards the end of his life and he had very severe COPD. He was confined to one room. He discovered a new uh, interest, went, learned how to use the internet and bought these semi-precious stones from all over the world. Thank you so much.